On June 30th, 2020, Lieutenant David Messer Schmitz was tragically killed in an F-16 mishap at Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina. Today, we're going to talk about the Accident Investigation Board findings that were released uh, last week. Uh, but first, something I haven't done a good job of is talking about the human aspect of these mishaps. And on the day that I actually, the squadron was briefed on this mishap, uh, so the Safety Investigation Board uh, released safety privilege information and then the AIB comes out later. But on that day when we were briefed, uh, I got an email from David's family and uh, he told me that uh, Mezzer was a fan of the channel and was asking if I'd be covering this AIB. And I took a while to think about it, but uh, I'd like to honor uh, Mezzer and uh, also uh, tell the story of what happened uh, as fact-based as possible so that there's no misunderstanding of what, what, what happened, because it's a very tragic incident and uh, there's a lot of lessons learned to come with it. Before we get started, though, I'd like to uh, take a minute to uh, talk about uh, Mezzer as a fighter pilot as a person tell his story because he embodies the make them tell you no mindset. He had overcome a lot of adversity to get to where he was in his career and uh, I'd like to point out the Lieutenant David Schmitz Foundation. Uh, again, 100% of the proceeds from this video uh, will go uh, as a donation to this foundation. It's Memorial Scholarship for Young Aviators. Basically, on June 30th, 2020, uh, Measure lo tragically lost his life due to fatal injuries that occurred during a training mission at Shaw. He was survived by his wife, Valerie, and their dog, Toby, his parents, Brian and Sherry Schmitz, and his sister, Laura. With the love, support, and guidance of Dave's widow, Valerie, and his parents, we've created the Lieutenant David Schmitz Scholarship Foundation. The purpose of this foundation is to support young men and women who want to pursue a career in aviation but have encountered obstacles similar to the ones Lieutenant Schmitz experienced on his journey to becoming a fighter pilot, which is absolutely uh, the make them tell you no mindset. Dave's interest in flying began well before high school. However, unexpected challenge during his high school years led him to flying. At 16, Dave's parents gifted him flight lessons and flying quickly became his passion. David began training in a Cessna and eventually earned his pilot's license at 17. After high school graduation, he attended Mesa College and enrolled in Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps at San Diego State in hopes to compete for a pilot slot. Dave was a member of the Arnold Air Society and he co-founded an aeronautical club at San Diego State University, Success Enabled Pilots, SEP. SEP was a service organization aimed at developing leaders who had a passion for aviation. Dave excelled in ROTC and all of his extracurricular activities. He was also one of his top cadets in his class. Prior to completing his degree at SDSU, Dave made the decision to enlist in the Air Force, where he became a loadmaster on the C-17. It was during his time as a loadmaster that he met and fell in love with Valerie, the love of his life. Valerie and David were married in 2013. During the beginning of his career as a loadmaster, he was a proud member of the 4th Airlift Squadron at McCord Air Force Base in Washington. He worked tirelessly to become an evaluator loadmaster, that's someone who can give check rides, and was selected as one of only a handful of loadmasters in the Air Force assigned to the nuclear mission on the C-17. Although Dave's personal and professional life were flourishing, he decided to take on the challenge of finishing his undergraduate degree. He did so in order to re-attack his dream of becoming an Air Force pilot. Dave's officer training school application displayed a history of accomplishments. To add value, the application was accompanied by heartfelt letters of recommendation from respected individuals. While he was compiling his OTS op application, Dave had one class left to finish his degree from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Despite a strong application due to a couple of classes at SDSU, Dave's GPA was just below the OTS requirement. His application was denied. Dave was well aware he was nearing his, the age limit to apply for pilot training, had to wait another cycle before he could submit his application. Dave could have easily stayed the course in his enlisted career with success. However, he did not give up on his lifelong dream and when he was able to reapply to OTS and classes were complete, he resubmitted his application with a GPA above the OTS requirement. This time, he was accepted. Dave and Valerie moved to Laughlin to attend pilot training where he graduated as number one in his class and was selected to fly the F-16. After pilot training, he attended a four-month introduction to fighter fundamentals at Shepard where he earned the Air to Air Top Gun Award. Following Shepard, they moved to Holloman Air Force Base where Dave learned how to fly the F-16 in the B course. Uh, toward the end of his training, he was selected to go to Shaw to fly as a wild weasel in the 77th. Dave did exceptionally well on all of his training flights at Shaw, which led to frequent praise from his instructors. He was seen as a valuable addition to the Gambler team and Weasel Nation as he was not only a skilled pilot, but genuinely an incredible human being. On June 30th, 2020, Dave flew his last flight. Tragically, he was fatally wounded during the training sortie, which we'll get to here in a second. 
Dave's story has inspired so many, inspired people to be the best of themselves, to be a better friend, a better spouse, a better airman. His legacy must live on and be honored. This foundation is dedicated to prov providing scholarships to young men and women with incredible potential who, much like Dave, who may have been told no many times on their journey. It is our belief that these driven, intelligent, incredible young indiv individuals that are told no one too many times must also have resources that can help them realize their dreams. The Scholarship Foundation will host an annual run at bases around the country to raise money so that it may have a lasting impact on those who want to pursue their education and become a pilot. And Dave was definitely someone who embodied the make them tell you no mindset. So we're going to talk about what happened. Um, and uh, like I said, it'll be as factual as possible. So. Three, two, one, fight off. So this is the uh, AIB report that was released uh, last week. Major General Randall K. Efferson uh, presided over it, and he gives his opinion. Uh, this happened at Shaw Air Force Base uh, on the 30th of June, 2020, uh, in an F-16. Uh, they always start with the executive summary. On June 30th, uh, the mishap pilot, which was Dave, flying the... Uh, F-16 Charlie Mike, tail number 940043, uh, was on a mission qualification training sortie. So the way it works uh, for your general progression and training, you leave the B course, so your F-16 school, in this case from Holloman, you leave the B course and then you show up at your squadron and you usually have, uh, depending on the squadron, the squadron specific syllabus. So between 12, 15, maybe 16 rides, I don't know what their specific syllabus was. And they call that mission qualification training. And that gets you spun up in the missions of that unit. Um, whereas the B course is general training. This is more specific to what your unit does. And uh, you take a check ride at the end and then you become a wingman. So that is your wingman qualification and you can deploy to combat um, after that. So that, that gets you, uh, a check ride and qualification in the aircraft in that squadron's mission. So he was on an MQT ride. So he was still on a graded sortie. He had not yet finished. He was brand new to the squadron. Uh, it was a night sortie, uh, 2226 local time. The mishap aircraft's landing gear was damaged in an initial landing attempt at Shaw Air Force Base. In a subsequent landing attempt at 2259, the mishap aircraft departed the runway and the mishap pilot was fatally injured during an unsuccessful ejection. It was planned as a four-ship night MQT suppression of enemy air defense seed mission with pre-strike air to air refueling. So he was supposed to take off, hit the tanker, and go do a seed mission. The first three F-16s of the mishap flight, which include the mishap flight lead, mishap wingman, and the element lead, refueled without incident. However, he was unable to refuel, requiring that the mishap element lead return to base with him. So basically he went to the tanker, he couldn't do it, and we'll talk about why he couldn't uh, refuel. He had trouble with that. Um, and then he RTB'd because they didn't get enough fuel to complete the mission. During the final phase of landing on runway 22 right, the mishap aircraft struck the localizer antenna array short of the runway threshold, severely damaging the left main gear. After briefly touching down in the underrun, so the, the part prior to the, the actual runway, uh, the paved area, he went around and uh, alerted the element lead that he had a problem. Following more than 20 minutes of discussion between the supervisor of flying, that's someone who sits in the tower and has checklists and can help uh, uh, be as a book reader or tell the status of the field and stuff, it's the operations group representative. Uh, they decided that they were gonna do an approach in cable arrestment on runway four left. During maneuver, the mishaps Mishap aircraft tail hook did not catch the cable and the left wing fell to the runway, dragging the mishap aircraft to the left. At that time, he attempted an ejection, but the ejection seat malfunctioned and the parachute did not deploy. The mishap pilot was fatally injured and the mishap aircraft was destroyed. They found that it was cause of that was his failure to correctly interpret the approach lighting system and identify the runway threshold during his first landing attempt, which resulted in severely damaged landing gear. Additionally, the IB president found by the preponderance of the evidence, two factors substantially contributing. The soft chose not to consult the aircraft manufacturer, which resulted in the decision to attempt a cable arrestment in lieu of a controlled ejection, and a series of ejection seat malfunctions occurred, which resulted in impact, mishap pilot impacting the ground while still in the ejection seat. So that's the summary. We'll get into the details uh, as the report goes. So the mission, there were uh, four 
ship of F-16s consisting of callsign Meet 4-1. Uh, Meet 4-2 is the wingman, so he was Meet 4-4 with his element lead, Meet 4-3. They were going to go take off from Shaw to the Bulldog MOA uh, and then hit the KC-135, conduct seed, and then come back to Shaw. When he couldn't do that, um, that's when they came back. The mission planning... Uh, the mission, mission was the mishap pilot's first seed training sortie, so he had never done suppression of enemy air defenses before, and it was his first time to attempt, attempt conduct AAR. So it was his first time in-flight refueling, and this is kind of a change, and we'll talk about the training behind that, but when I went through the B course, and when most of my friends went through the B course, our first time tanking was in a two-seat F-16 with an instructor pilot in the back. You didn't go solo your first time. So they sent him out solo at night on a seed mission he'd never done to refuel for the very first time ever. I mean, we don't refuel in the T-38, so the first time he's ever seen a tanker, he was solo and at night. So they briefed in accordance with the standards, directed the mishap flight lead to use a bingo or predetermined recovery fuel state, which would allow the aircraft to divert to Robins if required. During the flight brief, the mishap flight lead emphasized techniques for keeping situa situational awareness and how to refuel at night. The flight brief, la brief lasted approximately 15 minutes longer than planned due to sorting complexity and the amount of t instruction required. So it was a long brief. There's a lot of stuff to cover and they went over, which means they're stepping and, and they're late, which is not good already because they have to rendezvous with the tanker they have to take off on time all that stuff so they're already kind of rushed at this point they used the risk management worksheet to assess the risk of the mission to determine the risk to be in the moderate range due to the number of factors including night refueling thunderstorms in the area a wet runway and it being the first time for the mishap wingman and mishap pilot to fly a seed mission the do approved the flight's uh, uh, risk management level in the morning top three authorized the flight the mishap flight lead calculated the level of risk for the mission, neglecting to include the risk vac values for landing late at night after 10 o'clock, IMC, so weather, in the working area, and greater than five days since the last flight for both the mishap pilot and the mishap wingman. So he hasn't flown in five days, and he's doing this high-risk mission. Additionally, two risk categories, upgrade and never flown mission type, were included in the total score, but actually applied to both the mishap pilot and mishap wingman separately, and their individual contributions to the total score should have been doubled based on the guidance. So the risk management level was high, but they didn't quite calculate it correctly. During ground ops, the mishap flight lead was impressed with the mishap pilot's preparedness and timeliness, despite intricacy of the required setup processes for weapons and systems. Remember, this is his first suppression of enemy air defense mission, so it requires different uh, settings and setup in the jet itself. But they took off on time. So here's the summary of the flight. At nine, a little after 9 o'clock, they departed Shaw, rejoined with the tanker, call sign Turbo 27 for refueling in the Bulldog MOA. Refueling was delayed while Turbo 27 exited a dense layer of clouds and relocated to a different altitude block. So there's weather, they're dealing with uh, trying to get some clear airspace. The mishap flight lead and element lead refueled first without incident. Then the mis mishap wingman, so dash two, on his second ever, so this is his second time, not his first, but his first time at night, he did receive fuel, but bobbled somewhat, required approximately 10 minutes, twice the time of the mishap pilot and the mishap element lead, and was not able to completely fill his tanks, ending the AAR approximately 1,000 pounds below the planned offload. So the, the Dash 2 is already having problems too, and they're taking a long time on this tanker. The mishap pilot's refueling attempt, however, ended after being unable to meet the intense formation requirements to, to receive fuel. Following his unsuccessful AAR attempt, the mishap pilot is heard expressing frustration over the cockpit voice recorder. After being unable to receive fuel, the mishap element lead and mishap pilot are required to return to shop. So when you're doing air refueling, especially as tankers go, there are different tankers, right? There's the KC-10 and the KC-135. The KC-135 is much more difficult to refuel on because if they power up the inboard engines, the F-16 gets bounced around. It's not a very uh, substantial jet. It can be, even with tanks, it can kind of be affected by the wake. And so first time at night, trying to look at director lights, trying to be in the right position, you have to be in a window for the boom to refuel because the boom is actually behind you. You can't see what's going on back there. Your job as an F-16 pilot is just to maintain uh, the correct position so that the boom operator can plug back there. But if 
there's turbulence or if you're just not used to it or if you're just not off on your game. I've watched very experienced fighter pilots have trouble refueling. So he couldn't do it. It was nighttime. It was his first time. And he had been so successful in his career up to this point. Now he's beating himself up. Now he knows it's a graded sortie uh, and he can't even get the refueling part done so that they can go do the actual part that's going to be graded, which is the suppression of enemy air defense. So as someone who's been successful up to this point, he's starting to beat himself up. He's talking to himself on the cockpit voice recorder, you know, ah, screwed that up. And he's starting to let it get into his head. During the return to Shaw, the mishap pilot is heard once again expressing frustration of having to return to base early, struggles to maintain proper formation spacing and airspeed while training, trailing the mishap element lead. So they came back in a radar or sensor trail, and he's letting his basic flying cross check go out because he still hasn't compartmentalized because he's, he's young and he's new. He hasn't compartmentalized the fact that, you know, the mission is essentially a failure for training purposes and he's just thinking about it. Man, I screwed up. I, you know, I, I couldn't get the tanker and we didn't even get the seed mission and all this planning. We're going to have to do it again. And so it's, it's kind of getting into his head. At approximately 16 miles from Shaw, the mishap elementally commuted in a lighthearted tone. That was not the way to start your tanking experience. And then follows more sincerely with that was really challenging. In response, the mishap pilot exhaled and said, no excuse. So he's beating himself up. You know, he expects himself to be the best fighter pilot he can be. And it's just, it's in his head. At 2224 local, mishap pilot was trailing the mishap element lead by two and a half miles and establishing the localizer's lateral guidance. So they're on the ILS. At the mishap pilot was 2,000 feet MSL and below the clouds. He did not, re so he's VMC. This is just a visual approach backed up by the ILS, which is what we do at night. 18 seconds after intercepting and descending on the glide slope, the mishap pilot radioed that his gear was down. And the ATC acknowledged, issued the mission, mishap pilot clearance to land prior to transitioning to visual landing cues. Mishap pilot executed an ILS approach to runway 22 right with minor deviations and corrections. Two minutes after lowering the gear at 620 feet and 1.8 miles from the runway, he transitioned from the ILS to visual cues. So, you know, once the runway's in sight, you don't need the ILS anymore. You transition because you don't want to land 1,500 feet down the runway. You know, you want to land more in that first third. 500 to 1500 feet down the runway. Uh, runway 22 right is equipped with a happy and uh, approach lighting system. And there's also other lighting elements, including green lights for the threshold. This is what it looks like. This is the overrun that we talked about. It is not a landable area. And there is the uh, um, white lights. And this is where the localizer antenna is right there. Approximately 1.8 miles from the runway established on course with both localizer and glide slip signals. At that point, he steepened his descent from 2.82 to 4.5 to try to intercept a 2.5 degree um, approach using visual cues to land. So he dipped down below the glide path so that he wouldn't land long. I set the aim point at the 1,000 foot light bar. So he moved his flight path marker to the 1,000 uh, foot light bar right there. Uh, as the mishap pilot flew toward the thousand foot light bar, the vertical ILS guy indicated he was well below because he's visual. He's not looking at that anymore. And he did not declutter his HUD, which left aircraft symbology superimposed on the runway environment. So he had all this green stuff in his HUD, which obviously would have made the landing more challenging because he's got green lights from the threshold, green lights from the HUD, uh, all the symbology and stuff there. Remember, he's new to the jet. So what he did was basically a duck under. And he, when he began, began his flare to land, because we flare in the overrun uh, because the F-16 floats, you know, we, we shift your aim point, crack shift power flare and sh shift that aim point. Thousand feet before the threshold, uh, his left and right main gear, uh, main landing gear impacted the two innermost localizer antennas while traveling at 165 knots. The impact damaged, so he got too low. Impact damaged the left main gear, rotating the wheel perpendicular to the direction of travel. So it rotated. Um, split hydraulic lines creating a system B hydraulic failure, several the left drag brace front mount from the aircraft body and left it hanging by the rear mount, which was still attached to the wheel. After impacting the localizer antenna, the mishap pilot in initiated a go around, but the aircraft briefly touched down in the overrun because he was already low, remaining on the ground for approximately 330 feet and lifting back into the air approximately 470 feet to the beginning of the runway 22 right. So he touched down briefly as he got his speed back up, lit the burner and went around. Here you can see that's where he was on the ground uh, and that's the threshold and here's the missing antenna. 
At 1027, 50 seconds after impact, he radioed his mishap element lead who would execute a low approach and was flying in the airspace near Shaw that he had landed short a hydraulic pressure light and the gear stuck down. 20 seconds later, he declared an in-flight emergency to ATC and stated he had 30 minutes of fuel remaining. So then the mishap element lead rejoined to inspect the damage. Remember, they're wearing night vision goggles, so they can look in, uh, through those, which is also challenging. Wearing NVGs at night is not necessarily easy. Based on this uh, System B hydraulic failure, the mishap pilot and mishap element lead began reviewing the single hydraulic failure checklist in the uh, flight manual. At 2232, all three of his landing gear safe indications, the three green indicators, went away and they never came back. So he did not have three green at this point. Uh, after visually inspecting the mishap aircraft, the element lead reported to the mishap pilot and soft the mishap aircraft's left main landing gear was broken and hanging. So he could see that with the front drag brace at a 90 degree angle. But the right main gear and nose gear appeared to be normal. Based on that observation, they decided to go to the landing with gear unsafe up checklist in the checklist. As the soft began with landing with landing gear unsafe up checklist, he stated the checklist directs the pilot to refer to ejection if conditions are not favorable before proceeding to the rest of the checklist, which concludes an approach in and cable arrestment. Checklist notes potential factors that may be considered favorable, unfavorable, such as the facilities, the hook engagement limits, crosswind, runway overrun. However, no factors were ever discussed between the soft, the element lead, and the mishap pilot. So they said they're, you know, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, but they didn't actually go into what the favorable conditions were at the time. While reviewing the checklist, the mishap element lead confirmed once again that he saw the right main landing gear and nose landing gear down and locked, despite Dave reporting that his safe indications had gone away. In addition to the three green lights, the, his landing light was an operative, which is an indication that it's down and locked. It only comes on, on when it's down and locked. And the angle of attack bracket in the HUD disappeared. So that's what we fly. We fly angle of attack using the HUD. And those are confirming that you have a safe indication. If you don't have a bracket in the HUD and the light's not on, it's not a safe indication. Post mishap analysis confirms all these indications were consistent with a short circuit in the left main landing gear, up lock, down lock circuit breaker, which was later found to be tripped. From 2234 to 2242, the SOF, the element lead, and the mishap pilot discussed, discussed the courses of action. During this discussion, mishap pilot asked on two separate occasions if landing gear unsafe up checklist was applicable based on the state of his left main landing gear and the presence of steps in the checklist the group knew should not be accomplished. On each occasion, so he asked, like, hey guys, is this the right checklist? On each occasion, the SOF did not directly answer the question. And after the, question, after the second time the mishap pilot questioned the checklist usage, the mishap element lead reviewed the checklist once more and stated that he believed the checklist was appropriate because the nose landing gear appeared down and locked. So he's like, yep, I think this is right because the nose gear is down and locked, which the mishap element lead understood to mean the mishap aircraft was in a landable configuration. So he believed that it was a landable configuration and they continued with the uh, to execute the cable arrestment option. So they're like, yep, it's landable. We don't need to eject. We'll just do an arrested landing uh, option. Uh, from 2242 to 2248, the mishap element lead and soft emphasized on four occasions the importance of a go around following a failed engagement. And the soft reminded the mishap pilot that a ground ejection may be required prior to the aircraft departing the runway. So they said, yep, hey, remember, if it doesn't look right, go around. If it doesn't look right, go around. And if you get on the ground and it starts spinning around on you, get out of the airplane. The F-16 is equipped with a resting gear system, which allows the pilot engage or catch a steel cable. Uh, it's not like an F-18 hook or what you might think on a carrier based. Um, it's, it's a very flimsy uh, hook that's made just for this occasion. It's not, we're, these aircraft are not designed like an F-18 to, to land on a boat or anything like that, but it is, uh, does allow to uh, catch an approach end or a departure end cable. Procedures dictating how and when to engage a cable vary widely based on the type of emergency phase of flight uh, are generally specified for use during emergency when the integrity of the gear is in question. For any cable engagement, it's essential the pilot engage perpendicular and as near to the center as possible just in case you know you spin around. Uh, and there's a picture of uh, an F-16 take. I actually did a barrier cert in an F-16 where I took a cable. Um, to make sure that the cable could do it. There's actually what's called a conference hotel where you can call Lockheed Martin. They'll get somebody on call uh, after hours and get them on the phone, which will immediately talk about whatever the issues are and stuff like that. 
They didn't do that. They did not attempt to, to do a conference hotel to get the engineers on the phone to see what actually they should do. From uh, 2228 to 2247, while in the ATC tower, the soft coordinated with the immediate return of all 20th fighter wing aircraft, discussed the nature of the damage, talked to the top three, which is sitting in the squadron. He's the uh, commander's representative. Advised the uh, OG commander's direct representative uh, of the plan and directed the change of runway to four left. Um, during the time, the soft gave his quick reaction checklist to soft two and upgrading soft. So there actually were two people in the tower to back him up in case he missed anything. But because of the number of possible malfunctions, specific procedures for every situation are not feasible. If time and conditions permit, technical assistance should be requested. So the book says, if you got time, try to get this conference hotel going because the engineers might be able to help you. Uh, it's also in the soft checklist to do so, but he chose not to do that because he believed that they were in the right checklist and it was provided direct adequate instructions and direction for what they thought they had. So they believed it wasn't necessary because what they had was straightforward and with the information he had, that's what they went with. However, if it had been time, it would have been answered by Lockheed Martin uh, and an F-16 flight safety engineer would have been called. At the time of the mishap, three of four engineers who support the F-16 calls were available uh, and they said it only applies if the gear fails to extend normally, not when it's damaged or hanging. They also stated there's no checklist for this particular situation. The outcome of, of an arrest, attempted cable arrest would be unknown. They are aware of two other times where it happened, and in both instances, an ejection was performed instead of an cable arrest. So they're saying basically if they had called the conference hotel, they just said, let's go do a controlled ejection. Do not try to land this aircraft. So he lowered his hook at 222 knots and the element lead said, yep, looks, looks down and down to me. For the next five minutes, they discussed approaching a cable arrestment procedure. So that's another checklist they had to go through and talked about the go around. It, the reason you would eject on the ground is if it ground loops, it could cartwheel, it's not a good situation. Due to the damage caused on the four left at localizer antenna, it was vertical guidance was not available and they did a visual approach to four left because he had just taken out the, uh, the localizer antenna. So that's basically all he had was the HUD. So he doesn't have the AOA bracket that he's used to flying with, uh, doesn't have three green down and locked, and he doesn't have an ILS to help him at night. So he turned toward the field and reported he had 1,500 pounds of fuel, uh, that he had sufficient fuel for another, another attempt. So, I mean, that's no, normal recovery fuel, about 1,000 pounds in the F-16. I think it's a little bit higher for the Block 50. So he had plenty. He had 500 pounds to play with. He could go around and go all the way to emergency fuel if he had to. So as he maneuvered for final approach, the element lead asked to confirm that his right main landing gear and nose gear were both still indicated down in lock. And he said, no, I don't have any green lights. After referencing the checklist again, the soft recommended that despite the gear indicating unsafe, mishap pilot continue with the approach in, in cable arrestment because the gear appeared down and locked and was unlikely to become unlocked while airborne. Uh, the landing gear lights not illuminated despite being down and locked is consistent with a short circuit in the left man landing gear, keeping them locked in down position. At 2256, he reported the field in sight. 16 seconds later, he was cleared to land uh, on runway four left. He began his visual descent. Tower reported that the mishap air aircraft's landing light was not illuminated, which would make touchdown darker than usual. The landing light not illuminated is also consistent with the left main, main landing gear short circuit. So right before 11 o'clock, he touched down 730 feet prior to the approach in cable on runway four left with the hook lower, throttle and idle, approximately four degrees left roll. Lower portion of the hook assembly just prior to the hook itself impacted the cable, but the engagement was unsuccessful. So the hook actually did hit the cable, but it was unsuccessful. There are several reasons for that. It can skip. Um, there's nine possible uh, mishap aircraft install parts, settings and pressures, known system anomalies, geometric relationship between the hook and the contact. Most of these reasons affect the hook in known ways, and the fact that the cable impacted the hook shank five inches above the hook itself precludes most of those reasons. Remaining three reasons all involve changing the geometry between the hook and cable contact. The three remaining reasons are hook is intended to be able to pivot upon contact with the cable, and the shear bolt exists to hold the hook in place. In some instances, that bolt may break prematurely, so the shear bolt could have broke prematurely before contacting the cable. Hook requires some distance between landing on the runway and contacting the cable because it's got to ground itself. It's actually got to drag across the ground uh, to be in the right position. Or damage to the left main landing gear may have disturbed the cable as it passed over in such a way that it moved the cable out of the way and the hook had nothing to properly position or engage with. 
At four and a half seconds after touchdown, after traveling approximately 1,100 feet and 138 knots ground speed, the aircraft began to roll 14 degrees left bank, indicating the left main gear had failed to support the weight of the aircraft and the left wing had contacted the runway. The mishap pilot commanded full right roll, so he's, he's trying to keep it where it is. Uh, and it began to drift left. Momentary commanded full nose up while increasing the throttle to afterburner. So he's thinking, you know, we kept saying go around, go around. So he's going to go around at this point. At that point, he then pro stopped providing control inputs and decided I'm getting out. I can't control this. So he did try to go around, but then nope, I got to get out of this. Thing. It continued veering left, departing the runway into the grass field, flip nose over tail, came resting upside down. So here's the, the probably the, the the worst part of this. So he's got an ACES 2 seat. Uh, it's capable of successful ejection for all landing gear failure scenarios up to 200 knots. He was well within the envelope for the seat. Uh, at approximately 2259 33, 751 feet past the cable, he pulled the handle initiating the ejection seat at 129 knots ground speed in the nose, 8 degrees nose high in a 16 degree left bank turn. Based on that airspeed and altitude, should have been a mode one ejection and it should have been fine. During a normal ejection or nominal ejection, pulling the handle retracts the shoulder harnesses, locks the inertial reel, fires the initiators, jettisons the canopy, ignites two rockets, remove the canopy. Once canopy is left, the initiators are activated, rocket catapults, propels the seat from the aircraft. As it exits, the digital recovery sequence is activated, which is responsible for providing seat stabilization, pilot seat separation, and parachute deployment. The seat's drogue chute is not used in a mode one because there's just not enough time. Uh, inflation of the personnel parachute is almost instant, or it should be. When he initiated the ejection, the sequence proceeded as expected until the mishap seat left the aircraft, at which point a critical failure in the DRS occurred and the failure to sequence or control everything after that. Six of seven pyrotechnic devices in the seat should have activated during the ejection. However, none of them activated and the subsequent failure of the stabilization gyro, trajectory divergent rocket motor, the harness release thruster, two drogue chute severance cutters, and primary parachute deployment cartridge failed. This failure to initiate multiple devices resulted in the mishap pilot remaining in the seat following a parabolic flight path until impact the ground. When he impacted the ground, uh, the seat structure failed. The bottom of the seat was liberated from the back of the seat, so it broke in half. The seat successfully pulled the cable attached from the back seat of the emergency handle, so it actually did pop the chute once it hit the ground because it pulled uh, the man seat separation handle on its own just by how it how it impacted, which led to subsequent entanglement of the parachute riser cords, but the parachute itself remained packed in its container. So the, the chute tried to come out, but all I got was the risers. Uh, this handle, so it comes with the EMPDH uh, handle remains next to the pilot's right thigh throughout the sequence. At any point prior to pilot seat separation, pilot can pull the handle to activate the second seat, uh, system, which will man seat separation. The problem though, is that during an ejection, you get nine to 14 Gs, and you can't pull it while you're in the seat firing going up. And then there's a delay of approximately two to two and a half seconds once the handle's pulled until the parachute is fully deployed. So even if he had known on the ground to pull it. There just, he just couldn't have. There was no way to do that. His trajectory resulted in being airborne for a total of six seconds. Air, Re Air Force Research Lab analysis concluded that the mishap pilot had a total of 3.475 seconds from when the mishap seat left the aircraft to pull the handle and achieve a successful parachute deployment, which is just not realistic, especially when it takes two seconds um, to do it. He has to realize the seat's not gonna work. I, that's, that's superhuman, it's impossible. Uh, if he had executed a controlled ejection based on the locally developed controlled ejection procedure, so what a controlled ejection is, is we have certain areas where we we know that we're not going to, the aircraft's not going to be a risk to anybody, and we fly out over there, get everything set up, and then eject straight and level in a good body position and good parameters. So uh, if he had done that between two and 3,000 feet, he would have had between 13.9 and 18.3 seconds to pull the handle. Neither of these time windows take into account other factors that would have made pulling the handle more challenging, including the initial incapacitation from G-forces from the launch, so that 9 to 14 Gs, darkness, because it was nighttime, and a seat without stabilization would be rotating and rolling in multiple axis. So it's not just a stable, you know, he's on a trajectory. Due to these factors, any additional available time to recognize the seat's failure would be critical to overcoming the DRS failure. So basically, his only chance in this case with with hindsight being 2020, knowing that the seat wasn't going to work, 
a controlled ejection was the only way he would have survived this, which goes back to that if they had done a conference hotel, they would have said, Lockheed would have said, do a controlled ejection. Don't try to land with this configuration. An ejection sequencing failure also occurred in 2014 with an IP in Tulsa. He had a ton of flight experience, so he was much more experienced than Dave. He experienced the same failure during an uncontrolled ejection near Kansas. In that ejection, it successfully sent fire sig uh, signals to stabilize the seat, but neither separation nor parachute deployment occurred. He was at 7,500 feet AGL. During that time, it was daytime, fair weather, uh, and he had a lot of experience, and it took him over four seconds for him to recognize the failure and then pull the handle. So it was a tough thing no matter how it happened. I mean, even if he'd done a controlled ejection at 3,000 feet, it just, we don't know if there would have been enough time. So search and rescue was called and then they found uh, him, uh, they found the aircraft and it took them a minute to actually find him because of how far he was, but they did find him. He was wrapped in the parachute cord. They tried to stabilize his spine. And then on the way to the uh, hospital, they called uh, the hospital and, and said, no, we're going to call it uh, secession of life-saving measures at 2358 local. All right, so maintenance. Um, forms documentation, it was in the 781. They had time compliance tech orders. So there were two related maintenance issues with that aircraft. First was the TCTO installation of shorting plug on the DRS. So there were actually maintenance write-ups on this thing. It was not completed on the aircraft prior to the mishap. The shorting plug was designed to prevent noise bias issues observed in channel three of the three channel system. Two of the three channels must be in agreement for it to function properly. DRS failures due to channel three noise bias issues have been observed in approximately 9% of all live uh, ejections and sled tests. Um, the first opportunity to accomplish this, it was issued on 20 January 2016, and they could have done it 28 August 2017, but it was deferred for 36 months, uh, which would have been uh, two months later. The other thing was the service DRS shelf life. Second maintenance issue, uh, the DRS 10-year life had expired a year earlier, a year and a half. DRS received three temporary uh, shelf life extensions approved by Air Force Lifecycle Management. First was approved on 4 February 2019 because they couldn't get parts uh, through 2019. And then the second one, 2019, available parts, it was ex which provided a shelf life extension through 30 June 2020. So the day of the mishap is when it the uh, extension expired. Once parts became available, the third and final extension was approved on 27 May 2020 for maintenance consolidation efforts, which then extended it again to 31 July, uh, so a month after the mishap. Mishap uh, aircraft's DRS was scheduled to be replaced with upgraded seat sequencer, the modernized uh, ACES-2 seat sequencer, while the aircraft was scheduled for down for cannibalization maintenance from 8 July to 21 August, so one more month, and it would negate the compliance with uh, TCTO 502, the other one we just talked about. So the mishap pilot, uh, we talked about it. He was uh, in his MQT, very good, good work ethic, um, good uh, performance, EP management, time management, overall rating of average, uh, slightly above average uh, flying performance within normal. So he was doing well. He completed IQT with 72 hours. So he had 72 hours from the B course. And by this time he had uh, another 25 and a half hours. So that's how much he had flown. He'd flown 12 night flights in the F-16, including two at Shaw. So not very much. He hadn't had a whole lot of time at night. His two previous, fly previous flights had been with the same IP who after reviewing his HUD footage did not have any concerns about his ability to land at night. He was a weather cat four, so he could go down the 702. He had flown seven sorties in 30 days, 60 uh, was 11. He hadn't been flying much and that was due to COVID. Due to uh, the Shaw COVID mitigation measure, measures and adverse weather and program, he'd only completed six upgrade events. Impact of COVID mitigation procedures is enhanced by the mishap pilot flying only two hours and two sorties from 60 to 90 days prior to the mishap. So he had not flown a whole lot in the last, that 60 to 90 day time when COVID first started in that March timeframe. He had flown two night stories in eight days. He was current night landings, precision approaches, but had never attempted AAR prior to that night of the mishap. Never even had done air refueling, and this was his first attempt. IP was current and qualified uh, and proficient in everything they were doing, everybody else. They were medically qualified. They didn't find anything wrong with his, in his system. Same thing for everyone else. 
Things they looked at for supervision, Air Force directives require the MQT students not execute events such as air refueling at night until they have demonstrated proficiency in similar events during the day. Unless they are scheduled to accomplish, attempt the events in a dual cockpit aircraft with an IP. So he's got to have somebody in the back, and he wasn't. MESAP pilot didn't, was not able to accomplish refueling during IQT, the B course, at Holloman, and was documented in his AETC Form 904 upon leaving. So they said, look, we didn't get a chance to do it. You're going to have to do it when you get to Shaw. Limitation was not incorporated as a consideration or possible limitation in syllabus events in the 20th OG syllabus, so they didn't, never even thought of it. 70 says fighter squadron leadership was aware that the mishap pilot had not accomplished AAR before the sortie, but was not aware of the restriction on night events, and the limitation was violated when he attempted AAR the night of the uh, mishap. So they just it's not something they talked about. Directors require that MQT students not execute events such as SEED at night until they have demonstrated proficiency in similar events during the day. So he had to have done both of those things during the day before doing it at night, and this was his first time, all of it, at night. Um, he had not accomplished any seed events nor any events similar to seed prior to the mishap, therefore was not allowed to execute the seed mission uh, that was planned. Furthermore, the syllabus specifically authorizes any training sortie during an upgrade to be accomplished at night and goes on to specify possible adjustments to the syllabus in the case that all primary mission training sorties are accomplished at night in violation of the MQT limitation discussed above. The squadron leadership was aware that he had not done that but was not aware of the restrictions, so they knew he hadn't done it but didn't know it wasn't allowed. All right, so getting into the human factors analysis. The AIB considered all factors. Procedure not flown, followed correctly. Um, he didn't do a, a proper landing approach by uh, shifting his aim point and steeping his descent to uh, at the 1,000-foot light bar. Environmental conditions, it was nighttime, obscured. Um, it was, I mean, his, his, he has a limited night experience. Distraction, that's the biggest thing because he's basically being hard on himself for not being able to refuel and he's distracted that whole time coming back and he hasn't compartmentalized it. Now that's all he's thinking about. And then he, you know, he's probably thinking about it all the way to landing and he just didn't put it away as he should have. The supervisor command oversight's inadequate. You know, they talked about the stuff. He wasn't even allowed to do this mission by regulation and they, they did it anyway. And, and then the soft decision not to call the manufacturer through the conference hotel, um, which resulted in him trying to do an arrested landing instead of the controlled ejection. There are the directives and the summary. Um, we just talked about the summary. He finds that the cause was the his, his failure to correctly interpret the uh, landing lighting um, and figure out where the threshold was. So he mistook where he was aiming for the threshold instead of into the overrun. Uh, and then... He was not fully engaged on the challenge of the night instrument approach because he was stuck on the AAR thing. Uh, everything seemed to be working fine. It's just he was distracted and dwelling on his earlier unsuccessful attempt, which may have contributed to misinterpreting runway cues. On the night of mishap, the direct impact of his unsuccessful refueling was two aircraft returning home early, meaning the entire mission was ineffective for training. He was a distinguished graduate. He'd never known failure. He'd always done well. He wanted to succeed. Uh, he did his, I believe he did his absolute best during his first ever AAR attempt and was disappointed with his performance. He twice expressed verbally frustration with himself, as he heard on the uh, voice recording. First time was during his attempt and while descending for final. In addition, the mishap element lead made two supported comments on the way home because he knew he was disappointed. Uh, the first was lighthearted and the second was really challenging. Um, he responded in a lighthearted uh, tone by saying, no excuse. These comments were made eight minutes before the damage mishap uh, aircraft occurred. So the failure was still in his thoughts. Um, refueling is tough, and he talks about that. You know, it's it's precision formation event. They were The IPs were experienced. However, the wingmen were not, and the first wingman took a long time on the boom, several bobbles, disconnected from the tanker, um, and he got less than the planned amount of fuel, which probably got into the mishap pilot's mind. Um, but he was never able to stabilize the aircraft in relation to tanker long enough to refuel before returning to base. So they just they ran out of time uh, and they they reached their bingo that they had to come home. Um, it's just the the AETC, the B course is trying to do more with less. So they couldn't get to the the tanker part of the syllabus in time. So they pushed it off to the 77th, and they were aware that it was his first attempt and seed, and but they just didn't know that the restrictions in the AFI. So 
uh, displayed an additional lack of situational awareness, attention to detail, and assessing overall risks when filling out the risk assessment man, man, when filling out the 20th OG risk management worksheet. Miscalculation results in assessing the mission at a lower risk level than it was, which should allow the commander to be approval authority. In reality, the overall approval authority should have been the group commander, the 06, which may have provided a final opportunity. So it's the Swiss cheese model. There's so many steps along the way that could have prevented this that they just it just got missed. And there's a lot of mitigating factors, COVID, um, ops tempo at the B course, ops tempo here, trying to catch up from COVID that just allowed the, the holes to line up and the mishap to happen. Substantially contributing, uh, the soft decision not to call the manufacturer, otherwise they would have said do a controlled ejection and he might have had an, uh, an option to, to at least try the ejection, realize that the seat wasn't gonna work and then pull the handle. Ejection seat malfunction, there's just, I mean, they had deferred the seat so many times that, I mean, that's, that's the worst part because the seat should have worked. After all of this stuff, he was in the envelope. He was in a good position to eject and survive, and the seat failed him. And that, yeah. Uh, conclusion uh, was his failure to correctly interpret the ALS, identify the runway threshold during his first landing attempt, also find two factors, soft not talking to the manufacturer and the ejection seat, uh, which caused him to impact. Um, so that's the report. So, um, nickel on the grass for uh, Mezer. Um, this didn't happen because he was not an outstanding fighter pilot. A lot of things stacked up, and that's how we have mishaps. Good people, good fighter pilots. When we have this error chain and it doesn't get broken, that's when we lose aircraft and people, and it's, it's very sad. But I do highly recommend... Um, Support the foundation. I think it's awesome. It's just like the make him tell you no mindset. Um, I, like I said, 100% of the proceeds from this video will go toward uh, that foundation. I'll make a donation uh, directly to them. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description to that foundation and to the, the subsequent GoFundMe. They've raised a, a bunch of money for that already. And um, his family, they're just in my thoughts because this was this is a hard one to read. And this is a very uh, tough thing for even... You know, and even for the, the SOF who did what he thought was right and misapplied the checklist and, you know, he's on the ground, so he's not seeing the whole picture. And the mishap element lead, when you, you go down this rabbit hole and you think you've got a handle on it and it turns out not to be right, I mean, I, I feel for that whole squadron and that whole group because, you know, they they know what happened and, and I, I know that it hurts them. I know that it hurts their hearts because, you know, this, this could have been avoided like any other mishap, but it just, it all lined up and it, it's, I feel for them. You know, I, I, the, the people we don't always talk about are the survivors, but um, it's definitely tough. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching this. I uh, hope you learned something out of it and I hope we can all get better uh, as we move forward. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.